Welcome to the Melbourne Crime Walking Tour. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Lauren Towner and I am here in Melbourne bringing this to you. Instructions for moving from one place to the next will be included in the audio and I will have some non-location specific information available during the longer stretches of walking which will be at the end of the audio for the pin you will leave. When you reach your next destination, access the audio for the new pin. The resources I used are included in each pin, so please access that for more in-depth information. Our first stop is Old Melbourne Jail at the top of Russell Street. If you're not already in position, please make your way there. Now, without further ado, let's begin. Crime has always been a part of Melbourne's history, starting with its beginning as a convict colony for the British. Over time, it has seen all forms of criminal behaviour as each new decade brings forth different ways of flaunting the law. This walking tour will highlight some of the more infamous crimes and criminals from the 1850s to the 1930s, discovering some of the hidden history of Melbourne. We start the tour here at Old Melbourne Jail. Since it opened its doors in 1845, it has held some of Victoria's most dangerous criminals until it closed in 1929, including Ned Kelly and Australia's worst serial killer of the 19th century, Frederick Deeming. Of the 133 people hanged here over the 84 years of its operation, only four of these were women. Three found themselves falling into crime to escape poverty, while the fourth would have been diagnosed with a mental illness if alive today. While the severity of their crimes shook Victoria when they heard the stories, the lives of these women were not entirely different from those of other poor women living in the colony at the time. In 1854, Elizabeth Scott was a pretty 14-year-old girl forced into marriage by her parents, as her new husband, Robert Scott, had convinced them he was wealthier than he was. The alcoholic had drunk most of the profits he had earned on the goldfields, and by the time Elizabeth was 20, the Scots had moved to the northeast of the colony near Mansfield to set up a grog shanty. It soon became popular with the numerous single men who frequented the area, and before long, Elizabeth had fallen in love with a 19-year-old farm labourer, David Gedge, and had another admirer in their servant, Julian Cross. Elizabeth and Gedge became lovers, organising trysts whenever her husband was drunk and had fallen into unconsciousness, and the two started to plan their lives away from the squalor of the grog shanty. After planting the seed of her husband's suicidal tendencies with a couple who were staying nearby, Elizabeth, Gedge and Cross shot Scott on the left side of the head and laid him on his right side, unfortunately placing the murdered man in a position in which it would have been impossible for the shot to have been self-inflicted. On the body being discovered, Cross was sent by Elizabeth and Gedge to inform the police, where to the detriment of his accomplices, he immediately confessed. Despite Elizabeth denying any involvement in the crime, the three were found guilty and executed on the 11th of November, 1863. Up until then, no woman had been executed in Victoria, and there was a lot of sympathy for Elizabeth. She was a young mother, beautiful, and had been married to a bully who humiliated her and drank all their money. However, as an accessory, she was considered equally guilty and was led to the gallows with her co-accused. The second woman to be hanged in Melbourne jail was Frances Knorr, notorious baby farmer, in 1894. As there was little to no effective birth control available, abortion, infanticide and baby farming, that is paying a carer to look after an unwanted infant with no interest in what happened to the child, were the main ways in which working poor women could limit the number of children in their care. Nor found herself in this form of employment after her husband left her penniless when he was sent to prison himself. She worked as a parlour maid and tried to establish her own dressmaking business, but due to the depression, it failed. Her daughter Gladys was born, and after a dispute with her landlord, she settled on baby farming as the answer to her poverty. In April 1893, she took in a sickly baby who died within a short time from malnutrition and was buried naked in Noor's backyard, a house she quickly vacated. In May, her husband rejoined the family but was unable to find work, relying on Frances to be the breadwinner. She brought home another baby who died the same day and was also buried in the backyard. A third baby went the same way as the other two, and not long after, the remains of the first child were found as the new tenants wanted to make a garden. She was eventually tracked down, found guilty, and executed on the 15th of January, 1894, again with public outcry due to her sex and the young age of her children. After her death, other women came forward to tell police that they had also entrusted their babies to Noor, with as many 13 children going missing after being in her care. 
Martha Needle was the third woman hanged here, but she was different to the other three and described by Kay Saunders in her book Notorious Women as a, quote, psychopathic, ruthless mass murderer who killed her own children, her husband and the brother of her naive, besotted lover, all for financial gain, end quote. Between 1885 and 1891, Needle's three daughters and her husband had died, all but one daughter with severe stomach pains, fever and nausea the remaining daughter with tubercular meningitis. She received money for each of their deaths, except the first, from her husband's life insurance policy, and then the children's share of that payout, eventually netting about 260 pounds. Needing a new target, Needle found one in her new employers, the Junkin brothers, where she was their housekeeper. Within a few months, she was engaged to Otto Junkin, despite objections from his family. His brother became desperately ill, rallying twice when taken out of Needle's care, although dying when he returned the third time. Suspicions were only raised when a third Junkin brother suffered a similar fate, and a new doctor sent some of the patient's vomit for chemical analysis. It contained enough arsenic to kill a horse. Armed with this knowledge, the doctor and the intended victim set up a trap for Needle, with police bursting into her next afternoon tea, discovering 11 grains of arsenic in Yulkin's cup, which is enough to kill five men. Caught in the act, Needle was found guilty and executed on the 22nd of October, 1894. The fourth woman executed here at Melbourne Jail was Emma Williams. After a disastrous marriage, leaving her a widow with a small child at the age of 20, Williams found herself in a particularly hard situation. She moved in with a man who got soon frustrated with the toddler and told Williams to move out and fend for herself. With no government benefits available, Williams was forced into prostitution, something multiple women found themselves doing during the Depression. Williams initially tried to care for the child, placing him with a baby farmer when she could afford to, but as he grew, her clients objected to his presence and he was impacting on her ability to make money. One day she left the boy with strangers for three days. Eventually she told the people she lived with that she was taking the boy to the Salvation Army. In fact, she took him to the Port Melbourne Lagoon, tied a stone around his neck and threw him into the water where he drowned. He was found the following day by a council worker. Williams was arrested and tried and found guilty of the murder. She was executed on the 4th of November 1895. The fate of these women was the most severe experienced by women in Victoria in the late 19th century, but the hardships they experienced were felt by numerous women in the colony. Nor was not the only baby farmer operating, nor the only one accused of killing her charges, but she was the only one sentenced to death. Likewise, Scott was not the only wife who experienced an abusive alcoholic husband, but deliberately murdering him led to her execution. Williams was not the only single mother forced into prostitution, but her brutal elimination of her son placed her in jail. Life was tough for the women in the early days of Victoria, and these women's lives are representative of the extreme nature of the hardship women faced.